Welcome to RV Talk Radio. Here we talk about RV living, RV lifestyles, and RV travel. We also celebrate the RV lifestyle that gives us the chance to do outdoor activities that we couldn't do in a normal lifestyle. So thanks for joining us. Grab yourself a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and let's talk about RVs. Well, hello everybody. This is Rob Scribner from RV Talk Radio. This is episode 93, and thank you so much for listening to our show. Uh, Last week was a great show. We had some really good feedback, Uh, good, bad, and indifferent. It was all very professional, very informative, and I'm going to review a little bit. It had to do with RVers and truckers, so let's move on. So I got to say, uh, after uh, last week's show, we were talking about truckers and if they really respect our veers. And we had great feedback come in from uh, all of our sources, our podcast, our video, our Facebook post. Uh, great stuff. Um, one of the things I didn't really realize, but I kind of knew, is one of uh, my uh, comments uh, s- suggested that truckers... You know, they have a schedule to keep and they, uh, let's say it's Walmart. And if they're late to their destination on a particular time, that they are actually penalized. And, if, and I, I'm sure that's true um, or possibly true in, in a sense. And that almost makes me angry at the receiving companies that actually are uh, activists and and causing uh, truckers to want to be in a hurry. Uh, One of the things, uh, some of the other comments that came out about truckers is uh, a lot of people kind of don't think there's actually a prejudice or a a situation where they look down at RVers, uh, but they do get frustrated with an RVer that may not uh, be exercising good caution or... uh, being courteous and, and giving uh, trucks the opportunity to pass them and things like that. And I, I, that's certainly a true, true thing to, uh, out there. I, uh, I got to mean, I've gotten behind some RVers where I'm going, uh, come on, you know, uh, give us all a break. Uh, I know when I'm pulling our fifth wheel, I'm constant, you know, constantly concerned about what's around me. And, uh, when I do get a trucker, especially I hate when you get on roads where there really isn't a good pullout, or the pullouts are too short, and at the you know going at 55, 60 miles per hour, you don't dare pull over because you can't break in time to stop in that pullout area. Uh, so uh, once again, I always try my best to kind of indicate to the trucker, I know you want to pass. I'm moving to the right a little bit so you can see better ahead of me, and I will cooperate. You know, it's trying to send that signal that I will cooperate with you. Uh, it's in my best interest to let you go by. And besides, you're making me a nervous wreck. Uh, what can we do to get you biased? But uh, and then there's others. It's just like, man, they got a 18 wheeler that, you know, right. You know, they couldn't stop in time if you had to stop. And it's like, come on. But anyway, it was really good feedback. Uh, nobody was nasty. Everybody was very polite, very professional in their comments. Uh, some agreed with me, some didn't. Uh, some gave me what I really wanted was explanations of uh, some people saying a lot of RVers are ex truck drivers. And so I did get some good explanations. And that was what I call a great talk radio show. So thank you, everybody that was listening and, and, and participating in the conversations and, and not belittling each other. It was just a great subject to talk about. And uh, uh, that's, you know, for a talk show, that's what we all strive for. So uh, I, once again, I can't thank, thank everybody enough for uh, such a great discussion. And, and if I think of some more things that came up in that discussion, Uh, I'll bring them, I'll talk about them, but uh, please feel free to always give us feedback and comments. Once again, we always ask everybody's professional. Everybody should be able to have an opinion, good, bad, or indifferent, and everybody should be able to tolerate each other's opinions, and then we can all come come up to our own consensus. So uh, that's what 
America should be about, and that's what our show is all about. So thank you guys. And my next subject, I want to talk about minimalism. So the reason I wanted to talk about minimalism was I finally had time and, and sat down and watched on Netflix the show called The Minimalist. Um, and it's a show about two guys that have discovered minimalist living. Both of them were professionals, uh, similar to what Sherry and I used to do. And uh, what I really kind of appreciated about the show was it wasn't like get in an RV and, and turn your nose up to the world and go live your freedom or living in a van or a nomad. It was about everyday people and everyday lifestyles and everyday kind of living scenarios, whether in downtown New York or uh, smaller towns or different regions. And they were talking about minimalist living. And there's some things I thought they could have gone a little more in depth on, but, uh, and I'm not sure uh, how strongly they were actually getting them the message out. But I know one thing I can tell you for sure for minimalist living is the less you own, the less stress you have. And, and if you, think about that it's like okay for example Sherry and I we have a boat well I got to take care of that boat I've got issues with that boat I got to fix that boat I got to park that boat I've got to um, maintain that boat and that's always on my mind and always thinking about it it's a, a stress I have a RV it's Start up in Arizona. I constantly think about it. Is it in a good place? Did I store it properly? I'm hoping I winterized it right. When I get up there, did I seal things up so critters didn't get in it? Uh, not to mention the money involved to maintain that and what it costs to own something like that. Same thing with a house. Sherry and I have a house now. New things, you know, is the air conditioner going to break down? What about the pool? Uh, the pump went out. Uh, uh, our yard needs to be maintained. Uh, you know, uh, can we pay our electric bill? Things like that. So everything you own, you basically give yourself more responsibility. More responsibility can also lead to more stress. And so I didn't feel like they were kind of passing that kind of message on. Uh, but it was really good to see them uh, applying minimalism to everybody's normal lifestyle not just an rv or not just someone in a tiny home or someone who wants to live in their van but just general living and so simplifying uh everything where it's like asking yourself does this really hold value to me and if not get rid of it do i really need to have this many coats do i really need to have this many uh shoes do i have to have so many shirts and and uh on and on and on and and you know living in an rv sherry and i kind of had to learn minimalism and and when we rv the first time in 2006 we sold our house and got rid of all of our furniture all the way down to we talk about a lifetime of stuff down to a 10 by 10 storage unit and uh uh so you know i guess we didn't break it down all the way but we still held on to we had, you know, so many things that the kids were going to want when we we're gone that we had to store. And so, yeah, it was uh, uh, forced on us a little bit. And I got to tell you, it was, it was uh, hard to do at first and definitely a stress reliever when it was gone. Well, so now, you know, Sherry and I are in a house again and uh, there's a lot of things we held on. The second time we went full timing, knowing that eventually at our age we'd probably stop someday, and so we held on to a lot of our furniture and little things that uh, we didn't want to buy again. And so it was in a ten by twelve twenty stored up in Washington State, and there's videos that we've done that you probably saw us bringing that stuff home to our house. And uh, but. Uh, I look at those boxes and things we had, there's still so many things in there that we just don't need, does not have value to us. So I'm kind of hoping that we'll probably do some videos because now my garage was empty. If you looked at old videos and you see our newer videos when we got back from Washington, my garage is stuffed with boxes in one of our spare bedrooms. 
And it's like, this is ridiculous. I've got this 1,700 square foot home and I've got two rooms I can't use, my garage and a spare bedroom because it's got boxes of stuff. Stuff, all kinds of stuff. So um, our biggest problem is having time right now with all the, you know, it's with the boat and the water and traveling and using the RV a little bit and stuff. Uh, staying home long enough to start sorting through this stuff. But it's a high priority because our sped bedroom, we want to turn into an art studio. And so uh, that just ain't going to happen until I get some of those boxes out of there. So yeah, drive you crazy. So anyway, uh, minimalism uh, uh, can apply to any kind of lifestyle that you're doing, uh, whether you're a full-time family that have careers and you know, uh, doing your thing, living in town and stuff, uh, reducing clutter, reducing stuff you don't use, uh, gives you a nice open feeling. It really takes a lot of stress out of here. I think the only stress it would cause is you notice that your carpets or you need to sweep more, <laughs> things like that. But uh, other than that, uh, I know like in our house, Sherry and I are having a heck of a time realizing, you know, we got to really, you know, put some pictures on the wall which we make our own art so uh, um, I, having that minimalist kind of thing is like we look at like why why do we don't want to own a bunch of art and stuff so uh, we don't have a whole lot of stuff on the walls and stuff and we're uh, terrible about that and so a lot of people go are you ever going to buy a picture for your wall <laughs> so um, but it, the other thing was really curious uh, I enjoyed about the show was their emphasis on advertising. Most of us want to say, well, people don't tell me how to live my life. And so, but I'm telling you, I think it does. I think we're all influenced by it. And basically, if you really just watch, when you're watching TV and you're watching, even the shows that you're watching sometimes, you realize you're constantly being pumped up with uh, how you should look, how women, I feel so sorry for the women, of all this makeup and things and shoes and clothing and stuff that's just not true um, of things that you they think you should have and everything uh, consumer 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 and it's just uh, relentless and and they do talk about uh, Americans are just very materialistic and our society puts out that you got to have more you got to have the latest craze whether it's the new iPhone or the newest RV that's out there, uh, some of the new uh, solar systems, all that. You know, for example, I'm telling you that I've, unless I do hardcore, uh, really hardcore boondocking, I have one little 85 watt uh, solar panel to keep my batteries charged up uh, for just basic stuff. And I have a generator, and I can go a week or two just fine boondocking with just that equipment. I don't need thousands of dollars of, uh, of equipment on the top of my RV to enjoy boondocking. I just found that batteries are low. I can fix that. Run the generator for a half hour or so. I have a very quiet generator built in. And so uh, I never... Uh, if I during the day when I'm away, I shut down our systems. A little 85 watt does a nice little trickle charge to the batteries. I've always have enough, definitely if I ran my batteries low, enough power to turn over my generator. I just get by this fine. I did some minor, I didn't change out every single light in my RV to LED. Um, if some of you guys that have older R R RVs, ours is a 2013, but it still didn't have LEDs. So, I analyzed, okay, what lights do I normally use when we're in our RV? And those are the only lights I changed to LED because they were expensive at the time. Now they're getting cheaper now. But anyway, if you watch all these channels, this is like you got to get this converter and you got to get five 200 watt solar system um, panels on your rig and all this and, and uh, beef up your batteries and all that stuff. And you could put thousands of dollars into this stuff and realize you could get by just going with a more simpler idea. And that, and that's minimalism um, is kind of like that, where we're constantly being pushed either by reviews or with what somebody else has done 
uh, or by commercials and advertising. Uh, it's relentless 24 seven because if you're on and it happens not just on television, it happens on radio, it happens on uh, even when you're watching our YouTube channels, uh, you know, Google's putting their ads in our stuff. And of course, that's how we make money from our videos. And uh, uh, Facebook and all those other social medias are just constantly pushing materialistic items that trying to make you feel like you need it or you need the next version or your phone. You may have had your phone for three years. It's worked perfect for you and it's still working. But, you know, uh, maybe it's a Notepad 3 or uh, and now they're up to Galaxy 7s and you got, you know, uh, I know like sure and I just went through that. We held on to our Note, Note 3s forever until they started just not working well. Uh, but most people have been switched out every year. And it took us years before we switched out to our next version. And yeah, we're now Galaxy 8s. And of course, they're coming out with a new version. Crazy stuff. Anyway, so minimalism uh, is a mindset that even after watching that movie, I'm realizing I'm watching television. I'm going, oh my God, they're so right. We're just constantly bombarded with, you got to have this. you got to have that. you got to have this. Your kids... They're even advertising directly to the kids now. They're not even. It used to be time that they kind of advertised towards the parents to buy stuff for kids. Now they go straight to the kids, and so the kids. I've got to have this. I got to have that. And once again, it all comes up to our parental guidance of, of teaching kids that they don't need all this stuff. You just get you know find out what your favorite is, and if it's valuable and useful to you, and you'll use it for a while, then yes, it would be a good thing for you to get. If not, if something is just a fad and you know it's going to fade out in a month or so, and the uh, you won't, be, you know, it just doesn't make sense to get it. And once again, you've got to be responsible for owning it. And of course, there's those people out there that do minimalism because they kind of have to. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, uh, when you're on a fixed income and things like that, then the bottom line is, how can you live your life as minimalist as possible to be happy? Live with the resources you have so you are not bound by trying to maintain so much material things. So that's another reason why you see a lot of van dwellers. And, um, and I, I'm not going to say the nomads so much as the van dwellers. I'm, I, I did a show about those the other day. Is What was really commendable was these people with fixed incomes, and some of them are really low fixed incomes, are finding a way to live a life uh, that they're happy in and content and living with the income or fixed income that they are getting based on sometimes it's disability, sometimes it's medical, sometimes it's somebody has been retired quite a while and so their retirement income is uh, seems really low compared to today's society's cost of things. And so they're making their life as happy as possible by learning how to be minimalist and still having freedoms to do the things that they enjoy. And that's a good thing. But like everything else, it can get too far to the left. And so uh, you'll meet all these people that, oh, you've got to live in a tiny home. or You've got to live in a van. You've got to live in an RV. Uh, and that doesn't mean you have to be a minimal. I mean, if you want to be a minimalist, you can do it in your 300,000. <laughs> I don't know if you got 300,000, 3,000 square foot home. Uh, you'll be uh, quite pleased if you can just start from there and reduce the size. You might find out later that, wow, I really don't need a 3,000 square foot home. And maybe I can uh, look at refinancing or getting into a new home half the size. And would I be happier and my ever overhead might be lower? And you might be able to put some money in the bank. But yeah, um, so yeah, just like RVers, people can get off to the left or right or whatever you want to call it and uh, uh, go off on a tangent. And, and minimalist living appears to be that way too, where it's almost like a religion or a cult. And so uh, uh, all I can say about minimalism is it's all good. Americans do have, we're way too materialistic, there's no doubt. And uh We've been growing up that way, and so, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Now with social media, it's 
Instead of just being exposed in commercials on TV, it's 24-7. You are being sold stuff constantly. And so, uh, yeah, the shake that off. Be aware. Once your eyes open and realize what's happening, uh, you can start filtering it out. And uh, that's a big relief. And uh, your wall will appreciate it too. I think the other thing I kind of picked up is if you're going to be a minimalist and you have a, you know, they say, well, I have only three shirts, but they're my favorite shirts. And so the other thing is if you buy something, buy quality, buy something you like that you feel comfortable wearing or, uh, or, or like, for example, if you're going to put tires on your RV, buy the best tires you can and that's it you know just get good stuff and so when you do buy something buy quality and by not buying a lot of junk that you'll probably never use or hang up and you never wear again uh, you can afford to buy a more quality shirt a better quality shoe a better quality RV or a better quality uh, uh, equipment to put in your RV and things like that so that's another thing I kind of got from the film. So when you get a chance on Netflix, it's free. It's called The Minimalist. And you'll find it has nothing to do with RVing. They do talk about tiny homes a little bit. But it's just the ultimate of talking about our culture and how we are such a materialistic uh, nation. And uh, what can happen if you could practice and exercise minimalism uh, how you would feel and what it could do to benefit you and your finances. So anyway, uh, I, I hope that was a good discussion. Once again, I want to ask people, please leave your comments. Uh, please leave your feedback. Please be professional. Uh, this is taking one side or the other. We're just talking about minimalists as a nation. Uh, and, and as it applies to RVing, a lot of folks... Uh, using RVs have adapted to this new minimalist type living and an RV has been a good tool for that. I'd love to hear your feedback on that stuff too. So, And then we'll try to share those comments on the show uh, in the next episode. So anyway, thanks for the great feedback, you guys, and please keep it coming. Please be professional and please don't be rude to each other. Uh, this is a talk radio show to talk about all sides, pros, and cons of any subject we talk about on this show. So let's move on to the next feature. So I want to talk about pets a little bit and RVing and what one of my concerns were when we were full-timing is some of you guys who watch our channel, seen our stuff, you realize we have a beautiful dog named Cinder and she's a chocolate lab. So she's a good sized dog. And she's a wonderful traveler, no doubt. And she's she was great in the RV. And it was, you know, when we could leave, she could stay in the RV. She'd just sleep. She's just a sweetheart. But uh, more and more and more, as time has gone on throughout the years, all of you probably realize this, especially if you're my age, there's hardly any place to take your dog to run free other than some of these uh, pet parks. And to me, some of those things are like walking diseased areas. I just, I don't trust that people have got shots in their dogs uh, or their dogs are healthy. And uh, uh, so many times parks have been shut down because of certain uh, uh, diseases or, 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 or rampant uh, that dogs could catch. And uh, it's just, I don't know. And then I felt bad because we couldn't get Cinder any freedom. Uh, I just had very little places that she could run free. And being down here in Arizona, you don't let your dog run free in the desert land because we have critters here. And boy, it would just break my heart if poor Cinder got bit by a rattlesnake or, or something like that. and It'd just be terrible, and, and I'd feel so responsible. So one of the things i got to tell you that I don't, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I mean, animals... In a lot of cases, like Cinder, she just wants to be with us. So I don't think she really puts conditions on it. But I got to tell you that giving Cinder her own backyard where she can be free without a leash on and run around and, and it's hers and I know it's safe 
and uh, she's got a pool too, so that's a real spoiled dog. Uh, I swear to God, we got a house with a pool just for Cinder. Uh, it's, that's not the truth, but it seems that way. Anyway, so one of the things I got, and I love to hear people's thoughts about this too, because I know people that have all size dogs and multiple dogs. And you and, and you know, you go to RV parks, uh, a lot of them don't like you putting up the little fences in the front of your RV. And, uh, and, and so, and it's only a handful of places that even let you do that. And so it'd be really interesting to hear your comments about how how you're feeling about that. Do you feel that stress that I wish I could give my dog more freedom? Every dog deserves a chance to go around sniffing around without being held on by a leash, uh, especially if it's a dog that's controllable. Now other people have dogs that have to be on a leash because they just have to be on a leash. But uh, me, it was I always felt bad that... I couldn't give this beautiful chocolate lab that's breed, you know, they're, bre they're bred, <laughs> sorry, you know, to be duck hunting dogs. I mean, they're a, a sports dog. And so their instincts are, you know, to run and sniff and play in the water and, and you know, ultimately uh, do, bird, they don't want to do bird hunting, but they have a natural ability for that. And uh, so Cinder's a water dog. So, uh, there's a few parks we went to that actually, like in Seattle, you could actually go to a park that was actually on the ocean or on the sound where the dogs could swim. And, and of course, your dog come back smelling like a clam, but, uh, <laughs> but they were a happy dog. Uh, and there was a few places that had lakes. Uh, and like down here in Phoenix, there is a dog park that's actually uh, has a man-made lake designed just to let the dogs swim in it. But once again, it's like, if it was only a couple of dogs and stuff, it would be no big deal. But uh, like in Washington, I could actually go up the rivers that were calm parts of the river and Cinder could play in that river and I knew the water was safe. And and uh, uh, anyway, but when we were traveling, Cinder never got freedom. Very rare could we find anywhere I could let Cinder run free. And I broke my heart. And maybe I'm putting too much human emotion into the feelings of my dog but uh once again i love to hear people's feedback about their pets and their pets freedom um uh, traveling full-time uh in an rv even part-time uh how you feel about it and what your thoughts are about that kind of uh emotional feeling that maybe it's just emotional for a human but anyway leave your comments give us your feedback i'd love to hear it so, move on. So, I, I seem to be definitely old-fashioned. And one of the things that just drives me crazy is, when did the young generation suddenly figure out that if I stay at home longer, like to 26, <laughs> that I could get almost anything I want for free under living under my parents' home. <laughs> That's what it seems like. It's like, I don't know, maybe it'll just be my generation, and I'd love to hear comments about this too, but I know when I was in high school, and Sherry and I was in high school together, <clears throat> we couldn't wait to turn 18 and be adults. We still uh, went to college and worked, but it was like, uh, we couldn't wait to move out. We both have great parents. They taught us great values. And we wanted to go out there and go get them. <laughs> Dive into society, get our own apartments, and become whatever we were going to become. We were excited about it. And now I watch this generation of, of one is nobody wants to work anymore or get a skill. I've noticed that. And the uh, other part is they they want something for nothing. And a lot of them live at home or stay with their parents so much longer than, I mean, not just a little bit longer, a lot longer than we, uh, at least we did. And most people I grew up with <clears throat> um, wanted to stay home. They wanted to get out and, and start their life. And, you know, now Sherry and I were probably... Uh, 
very unusual story. We actually kind of grew up together and we actually got married at age 19, which I don't advise, but at the time it, it worked, we knew each other, families knew each other, and Sherry and I knew each other since we we're seven years old. So it was one of those, it just worked. And we've been married 37 years, so it's worked. So, but yeah, I, I just, I don't know, I watch so many channels where they have kids are still hanging out with their parents well past their 20s. Uh, I'm seeing that at homes. And then the parents, I mean, we were telling our kids, you turn 18, man, you're going to be treated like an adult. You're going to start paying your way. You're going to you're gonna be, you know, basically we always had the um, mindset that you're in training to become adults. And if I don't expose you to responsibility of a bill or responsibility of paying some rent or anything like that, you're not going to be a good adult. You're going to be shocked when you really get out there. And so many kids that go to college and then you know promise that they're going to make these wonderful get these wonderful jobs and make wonderful salaries and get out to the real world and they're in shock and then they you know freak out and it's our fault it, um uh as parents i guess would be the worst culprit we just want to give our kids everything and it's like and and what got me kind of thinking about all of this was watching the minimalist thing that i was talking about in the last uh uh, section is uh it's society is is got us all messed up i think the greatest thing that could ever happen is uh the <laughs> social media <laughs> breaks it gives all uh, or all cell phones quit working for a while and let us all get back to uh talking to people uh on telephone you know, regular telephones landlines and 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 meeting people face to face and and things like that I think uh, we're getting disconnected really bad, but I don't know why I had to bring this up, but it just, it's disturbing um, to watch our young adults, uh, and not all of them, there's some you know, kids out there that have been brought up in smaller towns and things like that, and they're exposed to regular skills and, and working on farms or working for construction and with their their parents and they and they really know real skills and have a real grasp of uh, uh, of the real world and they're excited to get out there and get on their own and that's cool um, so it's not everyone but it's I think it tends to be more of the city kids or people that are in very high populated areas they're just so caught up in social media and somewhere in their young life they figured out. If I stay home, I can get everything I want and a lot of it would be paid for and I don't have to actually be 100% involved in, in getting what I want. And Where did that decision come? When did that rationality hit their heads that it's better for me to stay home? I All I know is when we're young adults, all we can think about is when can I get out of here? When can I go on my own? When can I get my own place? And I want to get out there and um, I'm going to have an old couch with holes in it and I'm going to have a table, coffee table made of wood that's you know, like a, a reel of <laughs> those, those wire reels. We used those big round cable uh, reels uh, made a great table. Um, yeah, and hand-me-downs and all that stuff and none of your coffee cups matched. and uh, it was just, And you were so tickled to be on your own. So I don't know. Um, I don't think there's less jobs, and I don't think there's less places that you could rent that's affordable for a young adult to get started. We, we, all of us never lived in the best neighborhoods when we got our first apartments. I don't think any of that part has changed. Um, I think we've changed. <laughs> So anyway, that's enough belly aching or observation. Love to hear comments about that kind of stuff and feedback. Once again, pro, um, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, as long as it's professional. We love to hear from you. And uh, maybe you have a, a millennial or, may, or a young adult still living with you and you have a rationality. And, and I know we all want to protect our kids and when our kids have the best and all that stuff, but... Sometimes you have to throw them into the flames or what do you want to call it to uh, 
get them exposed to learn things to not be shocked. And I think that's why we see so much higher numbers in suicides and depression and things like that is we're just not preparing them for the real world because when they get out in the real world, they are truly shocked and they don't know how to function. And uh, not all of them, not all of them. Don't get that idea. I'm thinking of all of them. Um, but it's a large majority. Uh, they're just not being trained right and maybe they're not getting what we call tough love tough love is great love and uh, that would uh, uh, getting our kids ready to be adults that's the big thing anyway let's move on to a new subject well you know I uh, every time I see a fascinating movie I tend to watch a lot of documentaries and the last one I just watched, besides the um, minimalist, is uh, sustainability, which pertains to how we grow our food. And uh, got me to think, and is like, I think that's another thing that I hint towards about RVing, especially this nomads and all this stuff, is 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 definitely a growing um, popularity in that, and you're seeing more and more of it, and you're seeing more and more channels of it, and. Uh, I guess it comes down to is that going to be substantial sustainable <laughs> I don't use that word much in the future and the reason I noticed that is I was watching um, uh, less junk uh, more journey and uh, we actually had them on our show uh, last year and noticed that everybody's starting to fight for camping space and it looks like, and it appears to be, and it felt that way when we are out full-timing last year, it's getting more crowded out there. You're fighting for too many people are coming on board or too many people are trying to take this easy life or different lifestyle uh, of being a minimalist, getting in an RV, hitting the road. And then, of course, you hear me talk about the ones that try to make income from their channels. And uh, now... What my biggest fear is, is more and more people start doing this. And then on top, we've got the normal baby boomers that are just now hitting their 65s and stuff. They're probably RVing now. And now things are getting crowded. Um, and I'm sure boondocking is starting to get impacted by that. And you know what's going to happen. It, it always happens. If you're my age, you know what's going to happen. They're going to start making rules because one to five percent of those people will not take care of the places they go, the garbage or, or doing something stupid, shooting guns out BLM land and shooting things up or doing damage. And that one to five percent of people will ruin it for the rest of us. And so... Uh, um, I guess that's almost a warning is if you're thinking about this lifestyle, understand it's starting to get more crowded. It's it's more and more people are doing it and there's only so much free space out there too. So I don't know. Uh, uh, I know a lot of people picture that ah, boondock, I get out in the nowhere land and it's just me and we don't see anybody for miles. Um, that does still happen here and there, but it's it's getting more and more people are doing this. Um, once again, with the <laughs> uh, one of the questions that one guy asks is, all right, if we all become minimalists and we all live in this follow the dream and live for the now, how are we as a society or community going to enhance our lives or our community in advances in medicine and engineering and, and uh, all those different things? If we're all out just having a good time living for the now and just uh, uh, working to be happy, um, not contributing to society and getting out of the rat race. And uh, the answer is we can't. And so uh, um, there's a lot of people out there perfectly satisfied with their jobs and their lifestyle and their sustainability as, as far as a, a household and and a place for the kids to come for Christmas and all that stuff. Um, granted, uh, I know everybody makes it sound like all of us are 
are empty and, and need to get out and, and get this freedom. And there's other folks that look at us like, are you guys nuts? Um, you know, they, they are happy living in Seattle and, or Kirkland or in their homes for 20, 30 years and, and have that stability, uh, and, you know, go through the process of retiring and just, and, and being able to still go places and do things, but they don't look at life as empty. Uh, they look at it as perfectly fulfilled with that kind of lifestyle. So, um, do realize that we recognize that too. Not all of you guys need to just sell your houses, become a minimalist, be an RV or and go hit the road. Um, just using your RV or being RV to ex as an extension of what you already are doing is probably your best bet. And it is getting more crowded. And uh, sometimes that's where some of these memberships like Thousand Trails and stuff like that can work better if you can do things on a reservation basis. And you can't be as spontaneous as, say, a nomad is. And so... Uh, uh, it, it will get to that point where uh, these nomads are, are, are van care, you know, caravaner type people uh, can't just pop up anywhere uh, pretty soon. I think there's going to be rules or some way to register or, and, and you're going to have to start planning your your trips a little bit more. And I hate that. Believe me, I'm the... I'm the kind of guy who lived in Washington and in the 70s and 80s we just... Uh, threw all the kids in the car and drove out to Claylock on the beach and for it was first come first serve and that was it now everything's reservations and uh really stopped us from camping more and stuff because we had such crazy schedules all the time we were a spontaneous family and we kind of needed that first come first serve kind of scenario but yeah so i think things are changing be aware of that and just understand that you know populations are growing, more people are going to, and of course baby boomers are, are a large um, uh, population are coming into retirement age now, and so they're RVing, and and, and things are getting um, crowded, and that's too bad. It's a reality. We've seen it everywhere we all have lived that populations move and change based on. We just got to quit having so many babies, I guess. I don't know, but population is really affecting all this. And, of course, um, uh, advertising and marketing of all this kind of lifestyle is definitely bringing more people on board, which is great. There's nothing wrong with that, but do you understand it? That's one less campsite that you can stay at. Well, everyone, it's getting time to wrap up this particular show. Uh, we'll be uh, looking forward to talking to everybody next week. I want to really, once again, thank all the listeners and those who contributed to comments to the last show. So professional, such great information. We really appreciate it. And uh, once again, this is a talk show. So sometimes we bring up things that might rattle you a little bit um, just to get a discussion going. But that's all it is, and it's not always necessarily our opinion as we are just trying to get a few folks to say, oh, wait, Rob, did you consider this or did you consider that? And so that's what it's all about. But anyway, all you RVers or future out RVers out there, uh, I hope everything goes great for you. Uh, put number one on the list. Be safe. Uh, we'll talk to everybody next week. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you on episode uh, 94 <laughs> next week. Anyway, talk to you later. Bye. <laughs>